Welcome and thank you for standing by. At this time, all participants are in a listen only mode. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be posted publicly. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. Now, I'd like to turn the call over to your host, Ryan Rashardi. Ryan, you may begin. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. My name is Ryan Rashardi, and I'm a statistician with the American Community Survey Office at the U.S. Census Bureau. And with me today is Erlene Dowell, a program analyst with the Economic Management Division at the U.S. Census Bureau. This webinar is titled Using Census Tools for Environmental Justice, and it will show how you can use Census Bureau data and tools to plan for equity and development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental projects in your community. I'd like to remind you that today's webinar is being recorded. If you would like to follow along with our webinar today, we have posted the slides online for this webinar. The slides are available at the link you see at the bottom of this slide. The link to the slides is also posted in the chat. A recording and transcript will be posted on our website within the next few weeks at the same link. If you have any questions during the webinar, please post them in the Q&A section and one of our team members will try their best to respond to you as quickly as possible. To begin, what is environmental justice? According to the Environmental Protection Agency, environmental justice, or EJ, is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. Fair treatment means no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of the negative environmental consequences resulting from industrial, governmental, and commercial operations or policies. One of the earliest codifications of environmental justice into law is Executive Order 12898, issued in February 1994. The order instructs, instructed federal agencies to incorporate environmental justice into their decision-making processes, among other policies. You can read an excerpt of the, order, of the order on this slide, and you can read the entire executive order 12898 by visiting the link at the bottom of this slide. So who does the Environmental Justice Executive Order cover? It covers two main groups, minority and low-income groups. Minority is defined as a person who is either Black, Hispanic or Latino, Asian American, American Indian or Alaska Native, or Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander. Low income is defined as median household income at or below the Federal Health and Human Services or HHS poverty guidelines. These poverty guidelines are updated annually and the 2022 version can be found on the Federal Register at the link at the bottom of this slide. Now, with that introduction to environmental justice, I would like to introduce you to the U.S. Census Bureau. And yes, we do more than just count people. The Census Bureau is the largest of 13 primary federal government statistical agencies and conducts more than 130 surveys and programs each year. In 2020, the U.S. Census Bureau employed more than 10,000 professional staff and 450,000 hourly employees to conduct the 2020 Census. Only three U.S.-based companies, Walmart, Amazon, and Yum Foods, had worldwide workforces that were larger. While most people are familiar with the decennial census that happens every 10 years, we also conduct more than 100 censuses and surveys of households and businesses across the nation each year. This includes the American Community Survey and more than 30 other household surveys. There are also 
over 60 economic programs. Of these, the economic census is the biggest and most comprehensive. There is also information on our nation's public sector provided through the Census of Governments. The Census Bureau's mission is to serve as the nation's leading provider of quality data about its people and economy, and our goal is to provide the best mix of timeliness, relevancy, quality, and cost for the data we collect and services we provide. With that brief introduction to environmental justice and the U.S. Census Bureau, let's now go over today's agenda. In the first part of this presentation, I will cover the basics of the American Community Survey, or ACS, including how the data are collected, the topics included, and the geographies covered. Then, I will demonstrate how ACS data can inform justice and equity decisions in environmental planning. From there, I will discuss some of the tools available to help you access ACS data. Then I will turn the presentation over to my co-presenter, Erlene, who will discuss census products and tools from the economic division within the Census Bureau. Then I will cover some resources available on our website for learning more about ACS and econ data. Finally, at the conclusion of this webinar, we may re read aloud any outstanding questions submitted through the Q&A feature. The ACS is on the leading edge of survey design, continuous improvement, and data quality. It is the nation's most current, reliable, and accessible data source for local statistics on critical planning topics. The survey samples approximately 3.5 million addresses each year. These data are collected continuously throughout the year to produce annual social, economic, housing, and demographic estimates. The data collected through ACS is used to distribute more than $675 billion of federal government spending each year. Our estimates covering more than 40 topics support more than 300 known federal uses and countless non-federal uses. Examples of some programs that use Census Bureau data to, to, to determine funding include the U.S. Department of Agriculture in the Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or SNAP, in the Department of Housing and Urban Development in the Community Development Block Grant Program and the Public Housing Capital Fund. The Census Bureau typically releases three different sets of data estimates from the ACS each year in the form of one-year and five-year period data sets, as well as one-year supplemental estimates. I will discuss these data products in more detail on an upcoming slide. The American Community Survey is part of the Decennial Census Program. It is important to point out how the ACS is different from the census. ACS estimates are based on a sample of the population, whereas the census is based on the official count of the population. Every year, over 3.5 million housing unit addresses are contacted by the Census Bureau to participate in the ACS. The information obtained from the sample is then used to estimate characteristics about the total population in a timely and cost-effective manner. However, these estimates differ from those that would be obtained in a census where every nation, every household in the nation is contacted. This results in an element of uncertainty in the ACS data. As such, ACS estimates, including margin of error or MOE, the MOE gives us more information about the population by telling us how much the estimate may vary from the true population value. What does the ACS collect? The ACS collects information that previously appeared on the census long form, collecting detailed social, economic, housing, and demographic characteristics, whereas the census collects basic demographics via the short form, like age, sex, race, Hispanic origin, household relationship, and housing tenure. What is produced? 
The ACS produces population and housing characteristics, whereas the census produces population and housing totals. When is the new data available? The ACS occurs annually, reflecting a period of time over which the data are collected, averaging data for 12 months or 60 months, whereas the census occurs every 10 years and reflects a point in time. Census day is April 1st. The content collected by the American Community Survey can be grouped into four main types of characteristics, social, demographic, economic, and housing. Here is a list of all the topics the ACS collects data on, grouped into their respective categories. This table contains a list of the topics that may be relevant for environmental justice. The topics in the darker black font may be most relevant to environmental justice. So taking a closer look at the information each of these categories contain, on the left here, we have social characteristics, which include topics such as disability status, education, and language spoken at home. The American Communities Survey also collects basic demographic characteristics, such as sex, age, race, and Hispanic origin. Economic characteristics include such topics as commuting to work, employment status, and income. And housing characteristics include topics such as home heating fuel, home value, and vehicles available. As you can see, these topics, either alone or in combination, can be useful for environmental planners, academics, or anyone interested in environmental justice. These topics and more are used to produce more than 1,000 tables for local communities each year. Along with the numerous topics covered, the ACS also provides data for more geographies on an annual basis than any other household survey. The image on this slide shows some of the geographies for which ACS data are produced and the relationship between them. Lower geographic areas fit neatly within the larger areas directly connected with lines. For example, School, congressional, and state legislative districts fit neatly within states and do not cross state boundaries. However, they may cross boundaries of counties or metropolitan areas. In this visualization, you can also see the smallest geographic building block is the block group. The various available geographies for ACS data are useful for those conducting environmental justice analysis. For example, do you want to know the demographic breakdown of a county, zip code tabulation area, or census tract? This can be readily available through many of our over 1,000 tables. Environmental justice analysis can be useful when overlaid with other, sometimes non-census, environmental data. One could overlay smog or other air pollution levels with racial, ethnic, linguistic, educational, or poverty data to better understand the differential impacts of environmental pollutants on different communities. The ACS's unique ability to report on a wide range of geographies is what gives it such a broad appeal. Covering a, a wide range of geographic areas, ACS data are most commonly needed at the state, county, place, census tract, and block group geographic levels. This slide illustrates the relationship between these common geographic types and how they are nested with, within one another, as this example shows in El Paso, Texas. Census tracts are small statistical subdivisions within a county with populations of between 1,200 and 8,000 people. So think small towns, rural areas, and neighborhoods. Block groups are a group of blocks within a census tract of between 600 and 3,000 people, as you can see blown out in the right corner of the screen. Again, the ACS has the ability to report on a wide range of geographies, as well as to provide data at very granular levels like census tracts and block groups. A few slides back, 
we mentioned the, the different products the ACS provides. These data products are released about one year after the data are collected. ACS data are generally released in September, the calendar year after collection as one year estimates, in October, the calendar year after collection as one year supplemental estimates, and five year estimates are generally released in December, the calendar year after collection. For example, the one-year ACS data collected from January 1st through December 31st of 2019 were released in September of 2020. ACS one-year estimates, which combine data collected over 12 months, are available for geographic areas with a population of 65,000 or more. ACS one-year supplemental estimates are a subset of detailed tables that are available for geographic areas with populations of 20,000 or more. One-year supplemental estimates are simplified versions of popular ACS tables and provide the most current data to almost twice as many geographies compared to the standard one-year release. And ACS five-year estimates combine data collected over 60 months and are available for geographic areas of all sizes down to those granular census tract and block group levels. The full detailed data release schedule for each year is available on the link you see on the slide, which you can also navigate to by visiting census.gov forward slash ACS. Now that I've discussed the basics of the ACS, let's now investigate how ACS data can be used for environmental justice analysis. So how can the ACS be used for environmental justice purposes? The demographic, social, economic, and housing data is essentially one half of the environmental justice picture. Recall environmental justice is essentially the intersection of population and environmental data. So ACS data can be used to incorporate social equity in federal, state, and local planning projects. Additionally, because impact areas may be small, such as at the neighborhood level, one could filter data down to the zip code tabulation area, census tract, or block group level, as shown in a previous slide. Lastly, another benefit of using ACS is that it is continuously updated. We release new data annually in the form of one-year and five-year estimates, as well as one-year supplemental estimates, as I also discussed earlier. The picture shown on this slide is an example of the application of ACS for environmental justice purposes. The Environmental Protection Agencies Environmental Justice Screening and Mapping Tool, also known as EJ Screen. This tool uses ACS data to provide continuously updated demographic, social, and economic characteristics of the population in combination with various kinds of environmental data like ozone levels and prevalence of lead paint. A benefit of EJ Screen using ACS data is that the tool can be continuously updated with each annual ACS data release. By, by combining ACS's demographic, social, and economic data with environmental data, the EPA is able to maintain a mapping tool that aids those interested in environmental justice. On EJ screen, one could toggle various socioeconomic indicators, such as percent people of color and percent low income, along with various environmental indicators. EPA uses EJ screen as a preliminary step when considering environmental justice in certain situations. The agency uses it to screen for areas that may be candidates for additional consideration, analysis, or outreach as EPA develops programs, policies, and activities that may affect communities. There is also a new Census Bureau data product called the Community Resilience Estimates, or CRE. The CRE tool provides an important metric to measure the risk of every neighborhood in the United States should disaster strike.
These data are produced using a combination of ACS and Population Estimates Program, or PEP, data. The CRE is more relevant, timely, precise, and granular because we use restricted micro or person level data to create it, something only the Census Bureau has access to. The CRE program provides an easily understood metric for how at risk every county and neighborhood at the census tract level in the United States is to the impacts of disasters such as hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, wildfires, and pandemics such as COVID-19. Modeled estimates are based on 10 resilience-related risk factors shown on this slide. These estimates are modeled using ACS one-year microdata, the Census Bureau's PEP data, and small area modeling techniques. The result is a product that better measures social vulnerab vulnerability. CRE displays the number and percentage of residents living with zero risk factors or low risk, one to two risk factors or moderate risk, and three or more risk factors or high risk. Although CRE was designed to measure social, social vulnerability to assist in disaster preparedness and recovery, it is nonetheless a potentially useful tool for environmental justice researchers and planners as natural disasters could have an environmental justice dimension to it. The CRE will continue to be released each year. Here you can see the community resilience estimates in visual format. The areas in a darker shade of orange indicate areas with higher levels of vulnerability, while the areas in a lighter shade of orange indicate lower vulnerability. The CRE can be accessed through the link shown above, and they can also be, can be found on data.census.gov. Here we have a real life example of ACS data in action in emergency management planning. In the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina, the organization Evacuteer worked with the City of New Orleans's Homeland Security and Emergency Preparedness Office to use ACS data to plan the location of 17 evacuation points throughout the City of New Orleans. These evacuation points, called EvacuSpots, are designed to evacuate 40,000 people in 36 hours. EvacuSpot locations are marked throughout the City of New Orleans with these statues shown in the image. The goal is to reach populations in need by measuring social vulnerability in census tracts with ACS data on public transportation, vehicle availability, disability status, age, especially with regards to the elderly population, language by the ability to speak English, poverty status, and educational attainment. Now that I've shown how ACS data can be used to inform environmental justice planning and research, let's take a look at how to access ACS data products. Catering to a variety of data users with unique needs, we have a variety of data access tools. This is a list of a few of those tools. Quick Facts provides selected statistics for all states and counties and for cities and towns with a population of 5,000 or more using the ACS, as well as other Census Bureau data sets. My Congressional Di District gives you quick and easy access to selected statistics collected by the ACS and county business patterns. My Tribal Area gives you quick and easy access to selected ACS statistics for tribal areas. On the map for emergency management provides data for disasters, natural hazards, and weather events using the ACS, as well as other Census Bureau data sets. Census Business Builder provides selected demographic data from the ACS and economic data from the Census Bureau to help users start or grow a business or understand the business landscape for a region. Data.census.gov is the Census Bureau's main data dissemination platform to access Census Bureau statistics. 
My Community Explorer is an interactive map-based tool that highlights demographic and socioeconomic data that measure inequality and can help inform data-based solutions. This tool is designed to help users identify underserved communities as directed by the President's Executive Order 13985 on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility in the federal workforce. Census COVID-19 Data Hub provides demographic and economic resources to assist communities concerning the current pandemic. <clears throat> Tiger line shape files with selected demographic data or topographically integrated geographic encoding and referencing shape files are available pre-joined with ACS five-year estimates containing selected demographic and economic data in geodatabase format. And lastly, Application Programming Interface, or API, lets developers create custom apps to reach new users and makes key demographic, socioeconomic, and housing statistics more accessible than ever before. All data tools are available from census.gov. Choose the Explore Data tab from the blue ribbon at the top of the screen, then click on the Data Tools and Apps tab to view a comprehensive list of census tools and apps. I will now conduct a live demonstration of how to access a table that could be used for environmental justice purposes. I will demonstrate how to access a data profile and data profiles are tables that contain a variety of widely requested data. So first, let's go to data.census.gov. Then we're going to go ahead and click Advanced Search. Then on the left, under Find a Filter, let's click Surveys, then American Community Survey, then Five-Year Estimates, that's the most recent one we have available, and then we're going to select Data Profiles. Now, you can apply other other filters. For this demonstration, I'm going to select a geography, St. James Parish, uh, Louisiana. Although Louisiana calls them parishes, they are categorized as counties, so let's select counties. So geography, county, it'll bring you to your state, list of states, so let's scroll down to Louisiana. And then the, ge the geography we're looking for is St. James Parish. So we'll scroll down. It's in alphabetical order. And I see St. James Parish, so we'll select that. Now from here, we will click search. And this brings you a list of the data profiles, which we selected earlier. And they are all for um, St. James Parish, which you can also see the, the geography on the right here. And there are multiple uh, data profiles. We have four of them. Um, I am going to select this first one, DP05 ACS Demographic and Housing Estimates. Table DP05 is a data profile, a popular table that contains a plethora of popular and useful information including race and ethnicity, age, sex, and more. You can filter tables by a wide variety of geographies, as I mentioned earlier. Um, here, table DP05 is for St. James Parish, Louisiana, a parish in Louisiana that is commonly cited as, a, as an example of environmental injustice. St. James Parish is a part of an area sometimes referred to by academics and others as Cancer Alley, which is a region of several parishes in Louisiana that has a high concentration of petrochemical production. 
The area has been noted in studies for having higher rates of cancer. The area additionally has population proportions of Black or African American people that are higher than the national average. Thus, Cancer Alley is a commonly cited example of environmental injustice. ACS data allows researchers, planners, and others to better understand the populations who live in Cancer Alley. Although this table shows the entire parish, one could further narrow down the geography to provide data at the census tract or block group level. And I will scroll down here just so you can see a little bit more of some of the data that they have. Um, it breaks it down by sex and age at the top, but as you can see, it's a pretty detailed table and has information on race, one race, um, and so on and so forth, race alone or in combination, Hispanic or Latino. So it is important to note that ACS only provides demographic, social, housing, and economic data. It must be combined with environmental data in order to produce an environmental justice analysis. And with that demonstration out of the way, I will go back to the PowerPoint. And with that, I will turn it over to my co-presenter, Erlene. Thank you, Ryan. All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. And today I will be sharing with you a little bit about the Longitudinal Employer Household Dynamics Program or the LEHD program and its products. First, we'll look at where the data comes from. LEHD products are different from other census data in the fact that our data comes from our Local Employment Dynamics or LED partnership, which is a voluntary federal state partnership. Its main purpose is to merge employee data and employer data to produce a collection of enhanced labor market statistics with state-of-the-art confidentiality protection. Under the partnership, states send their unemployment insurance wage records and their quarterly census of employment wage data, which is then combined with censuses and surveys to create this dynamic information as workers to produce public use data products, as well as microdata for research. The UI records give us job data, the QCEW gives us firm data, and our person data comes from censuses and surveys. When I first started working for the Census Bureau, we had two data sets and three data tools. Now LEHD has three main data sets and two experimental data sets with seven different data tools for easy access. Each data set along with each data tool is unique in its own way. If you are curious about employment, hires, separations, turnovers, and earnings, you would look at the quarterly workforce indicators or QWI utilizing QWI Explorer or the LED extraction tool. If you want to look at employment for detailed and customized geography, you would look at the loads data using on the map or on the map for emergency management data tools and coming next year in the LED extraction tool. On the map for emergency management is the only data tool that's part of the LEHD suite of tools that has population data along with data from other federal agencies. If you want to look at statistics on job mobility across state boundaries or industries, transitions between jobs by timing and firm, or worker characteristics or earning changes due to job changes, you would use the job to job or J to J flows data using the J to J Explorer and also coming soon in our LED extraction tool. One of our newer data sets is the post secondary employment outcomes or PSEO. This experimental data set reports earnings by institution, degree field, degree level, and graduation cohort for one, five, and 10 years after graduation and is accessible through the PSEO Explorer. 
The current release includes 17 participating states with more to come in the near future. Finally, we have another experimental data set called the Veteran Employment Outcomes, or VEO. This new experimental data set reports earnings and employment outcomes for U.S. Army veterans 1, 5, and 10 years after discharge by military occupation, rank, demographics, industry, and geography of employment. This is also accessible through our VEO Explorer. In addition to the data tools, raw data downloads are available, along with LEHD microdata for approved projects through our secure census research data centers. Today, I will just be covering only two of the data tools, on the map and on the map for emergency management, to demonstrate how these two data tools can be used in planning, in implementing, and enforcement of environmental community projects. In 2020, an article out of South Dakota during a COVID-19 breakout at a popular manufacturing port plant uh, that was located in Minnehaha County, South Dakota, utilized loads data to track where workers from a plant in Minnehaha County resided. The data show that many that worked in Minnehaha also lived in Minnehaha, but the next largest of the workers resided in Lincoln County. The data also pointed out that there were a number of Native Americans who worked at the plant and resided at nearby reservations where there is a lack of medical resources to a vulnerable population. So here we're going to be looking at how we can utilize on the map and on the map for emergency management during COVID-19. On the map is a robust data tool that allows users to analyze workforce characteristics all the way down to a census block. The tool allows analysts to look at workforce compositions by industry and demographic characteristics, along with worker inflow and outflow and commuting patterns. This analysis shows you in the direction of where workers are coming from who work in Minnehaha. The article also talked about how Lincoln County was the second largest county with workers that commuted to Minnehaha, which is shown here in the table on the right. In this screenshot, we were able to use the base map to locate tribal lands and tribal subdivisions. When we change the results to top 25 counties, we can visually see the spokes reach to these vulnerable populations. We can also change the analysis setting to area profile to look at the details of the worker race and earnings. So let's go live to look at this example. So the easiest way to get to on the map is probably if you Google on the map, which is one word, and um, it'll bring you to the on the map webpage, or you can remember on the map dot CES dot census dot gov and I just want to let everyone know that um, Chrome and Firefox play best with our applications just because we have so many details and so many graphics to download. So here I will go ahead in the search box and type in Minnehaha and then I'll click search and once I do that, all of the different geographies that have Minnehaha comes up. So we're going to be looking at Minnehaha County, South Dakota. Once I click on that, another pop up comes up and the map zooms into Minnehaha. So what we're looking at is how many uh, square miles are in this selection area and how many census blocks. The application is so intuitive that you're going to know that the next step would be to perform analysis on the selection area. Once I do that, another pop up comes up and it has all of the different analysis settings. So in the 1st column, we can see where the worker lives or where the worker works. In the next column, we have different types of, net of analyses that we can look at. Today, we're going to look at the area profile, which is an overview of all the different characteristics in the selected area. And then we're going to look at destination also. You can choose up to as many years as you want all the way up to 2002. So if you want to put it all in there, you could if you wanted to. And you can change the job type. So the 
all jobs is every single job that's out there. Um, if you have more than one job, that's where it would be. Um, and then primary jobs is the jobs that bring home the most income. And then for the private jobs, um, the all private jobs and the private primary jobs, that's just pretty much just private jobs. Um, if you hover over any of the question marks throughout the application, um, you'll get a definition of what you're looking at. So at this point, we're going to do the destination first, and I'm going to click on uh, the destination type. We want to look at counties and then here where there's this lightning bolt go exclamation point. I'm going to click on that. Once I do that, the map updates and then a table comes up also, and you can see a little bit of a graph as well. But here in the table, you can see all the counties. You can see Minnehaha is the first county and you can see Lincoln County. So these are workers that work in Minnehaha, but live in Minnehaha County, Lincoln County or Brook Brookings. So this, these are the top 10 right now that we're looking at. So um, I'm gonna click on this spoke overlay here in the left-hand side. Uh, under map controls, just so that we can give you a visual. So like when you're thinking about COVID-19 and you're thinking about the infection in Minnehaha, this is where it's all going out to. And then if you click on the base map, and if I scroll down a little bit and I'm gonna click on tribal lands, You can now see, and I'm just going to zoom out just a bit so you can see it better. Um, you can see the different areas that are tribal lands as well as um, tribal subdivisions. But if I go ahead and do this, if I change the top results, right now we're just looking at the top 10 counties. But if I click on top 25, the reach starts to go out a little further. And you can see, you know, now we're starting to touch the different um, tribal lands. But if I go out to 50, now you can see the visual and what, you know, what, what a visual it gives you about how you know, COVID-19 at the time was spreading if you worked in Minnehaha at this um, work plant. So we'll go ahead and change the settings a little bit. So down in the lower left-hand corner, I'm gonna click on change settings. And now I just wanna look at area profile. And then I'm gonna go ahead and click go again. So area profile gives you more details about uh, the different characteristics. It gives you what the total jobs are again. It also gives you the worker age, their earnings, but we can look at the NAICS industry and we can see that, you know, 10% of the workforce worked in manufacturing. And then we can scroll down more and we can look at the worker race. So where it says American Indian, we can see that it's 1.7%, but 1,871 people, that's really a lot of people. And if I click on American Indian, the map actually updates and we can just see just those, those American Indians. Okay, so going back to the PowerPoint, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and now we're gonna talk about on the map sister map, on the map for emergency management. So on the map for emergency management is a public data tool that provides an intuitive web-based interface for accessing US population and workforce statistics in real time for areas being affected by natural disasters. The tool allows users to retrieve reports containing detailed workforce, population, and housing characteristics for hurricanes, flood, wildfires, winter storms, and federal disaster declaration areas. On the map for emergency management has population data from the American Community Survey and 2010 decennial. 
economic data comes from the LEHD origin destination employee statistics or the loads data, along with data from other federal agencies. On the map, for emergency management has been named mission critical by the Department of Commerce. That means if anything should happen, such as a shutdown, the application will continue to be available to the public. On the map for emergency management tracks tropical storms and hurricanes, floods and freezing temperatures and snowfall from our sister agency, NOAA. It also tracks fires from the Department of Agriculture and Department of Interior. And finally, the map covers disaster declaration areas from the Federal Emergency Management Agency. All of these data are combined with census data. We have data from 2010 to 2019 for most of the 50 states, including DC. You can customize the selection area as low as places or cities with disclosure protection and output reports are available, which means you can export shapefiles and download and print reports and maps. You can also share event links on social media or with colleagues. On the map for emergency management can assist in identifying vulnerabilities, social vulnerabilities, physical vulnerabilities, and economic vulnerabilities. Using the ACS, we can see social and physical vulnerabilities. We can see households with one or more people 65 years or over. We can see if they are disabled, and we can see a house heating fuel or year structure was built to name a few physical vulnerabilities. Using the decennial data, we can also access the physical vulnerabilities, whether a house is occupied or vacant. And to understand economic vulnerabilities of the event using the loads data, we can look at total number of workers in the impacted area, the industry impacted in the area, and earnings for money lost to workers in the impacted area. Because I'm very familiar with this case study, we are going to jump into the Emergency Management Declaration 3475. Uh, here we can look at the vulnerabilities such as race, ability to speak English, or ethnicity. And just to let you know, the 3475 is um, the South Dakota, the state of South Dakota during COVID-19, when all 50 states were uh, declared a de disaster declaration area because of COVID. We can also dive deeper into the geography and choose to just look at Minnehaha County and its vulnerabilities. So let's go live again. And same thing, uh, the easiest way to get to on the map for emergency management would be to Google on the map one word and uh, type in for emergency management, or you can remember on the map.ces.census.gov slash EM. All right, so Right now, we're looking at real-time data. Um, we can see that there's a little bit of uh, pink snowflakes, which means snowfall um, up in the northern areas. We can see a little bit of wildfires that are going on in the Midwest. Some flooding that comes around is the yellow houses. And then um, all the orange life preservers are the, are the disaster declaration areas. On the left-hand side, you can see all of the current events that are happening. And there are a lot of ways that you can go into uh, the different events. You can click on the map, you can type in the search box um, and sorts all sorts of different things. So we're gonna type in EM-3475. Uh, and then it automatically comes up uh, COVID-19 pandemic, but I just wanna kind of show you this little filter. If you wanted to just look at certain things, um, you can just choose to look at tropical storms or wildfires or floods, et cetera. But I'm just gonna go ahead and ju I just wanted to show you that. So we're gonna click on EM3475 and then it zooms into uh, on the map for emergency management. And then this is where we're looking at the ACS data. So we can scroll down and we can see what the different race is that was impacted by um, COVID-19. We can see what how many American Indians live in South Dakota. So we can see 60, 62,812. Uh, we talked about the disability status by age. 
but there is also disability status by poverty status. And you can click on all of this and everything kind of up, updates on the map as well as the bar charts. And then we can scroll down and we can see the year the structure was built and how many homes were actually built, which is a lot, before 1939. And we can look at mobile homes, um, how many mobile homes, like for example, if there was a tornado that went through, how many of those homes might be impacted on that and so on. Oh, and then the house heating fuel. So we can look at that and then we can see, you know, the possibility of during a snowstorm, how many people might lose electricity. So anyway, those are some of the vulnerabilities that we can look at. And then um, we can click on the uh, topic and we can look at the workforce employed in the uh, event area. So again, we're still looking at South Dakota, but if I change this event area, I'm gonna go ahead and click on this and click on counties and Minnehaha comes up at the top. So I'll select Minnehaha and it zooms into Minnehaha and we are still looking at the workforce employed. And then as we did um, in the on the map, we can see NAICS industry sector, and we can see what is manufacturing again. And we can look at what the educational attainment is, what the earnings are. And then so on, and then the race. So also wanted to let you know, if I click on this um, hyperlink right here, it takes us straight to South Dakota COVID-19 and it tells you what the funding obligations are. And then there's the designated areas, a couple news releases and reports. And we'll come back to that and I'll show you um, some more cool stuff on that. So using another uh, case study, this was in 2014 uh, with Elk River chemical spill. Uh, on January 9th, 2014, more than 10,000 gallons of a coal cleaning liquid spilled from two above ground storage tanks into the Elk River. This river was the sole water supply for the Charleston, West Virginia area. Residents of nine counties in West Virginia were impacted when an estimated, as we said, uh, 10,000 gallons were spilled. So these counties included Boone, Clay, Jackson, Kanawha, Lincoln, Logan, Putnam, Roan, and Cable County. Again, utilizing on the map for emergency management, we can once again use the emergency management declaration EM3366 to look at the vulnerabilities of the population. And so we'll go live in a minute to work through this example. In this screenshot, using the advanced selection tool, now we've actually hopped over to on the map, uh, we can actually import the KML, sh KML shape files into on the map from the FEMA disaster declaration areas. And it also, we can look at uh, another screenshot where we can look at the vulnerabilities of where the workers live and their education level. We can even click on specific characteristics to see the location of where they live on the map. So let's go live again. That was a lot. And we're gonna go to the on the map for emergency management again, and I'm just gonna refresh it. And I will type in EM dash three three six six and that'll bring me to the emergency declaration again we can see west virginia and then if i click on the em3366 it takes me to the uh, west virginia chemical spill and then we're going to go ahead and click on the designated areas and here where it says google earth i'm going to download that So I'm gonna go back to the on the map tab and then I'm just gonna reload this so that we have a clean slate so we can work on this. And now where it says import from KML, I'll click on that. We're gonna choose file. It should be in my downloads. And then I'm gonna import that. 
So once I import that, it goes into the map. We can zoom to import its shape so we can see it a lot better. And here are the nine counties that we talked about earlier. So I'm going to go ahead and click on select all polygons because we want to look at it all. And then we'll go ahead and click on continue with selected features. And then it comes into the advanced section for on the map. So here we can just go ahead and click on confirm selection. And then we'll click on perform analysis. And then we're going to look at the area profile again. And now we can see what the total count of private primary jobs were in that area. But I had talked about the, um, the worker educational attainment. So I thought this was very interesting to see that 26.2% um, had high school or equivalent and then 25% had 25.5%. Um, so, you know, we, there's a possibility at looking at low skilled workers at this point. So another um, really cool thing that I like that um, on the map does is like if I zoom in just a little bit and I'll click on this identify and I can click on one of these little bubbles and that represents um, the different blocks um, and how many jobs are in that block. So we can see in these block numbers all of the different um, areas that have workers. You can also click on, you remember earlier we clicked on just the blue um, hyperlink and then we can also do it again, identify. And now we're just looking at characteristic high school or equivalent no college so all in these different blocks and look at this one this one has 523 that have um, only a high school education it's just very fascinating stuff so close out of that back to the powerpoint and then we're gonna just finish off with one more example um, so this is a diagram just as this is just the diagram that shows the analyzing of the chemical concentration on day one through day nine and the flow of the chemical spill down the river. So we are just using this visual to demonstrate the selection drawing tools for on the map. So by drawing a, a line down the river and then creating a ring that's maybe five miles out, we can see the worker population of those who may be impacted by the contaminated water source. So let's go ahead and do this again. We're going live and I'm just going to reload this. Give us a clean slate one more time. And then in the search box, I'm going to type in Charleston. Click on search. And then we will go down to see cities. And then I'll click on Charleston City, West Virginia. And instead of clicking on the perform analysis, I'm just going to click out of that box and I'm going to zoom in just a bit so we can see the river. Maybe zoom out just a touch. So we know that the um, chemical spill kind of started up here in this area. So I'm going to click on the selection tab. I'm going to clear this selection. We don't want to look at any of that. I'm going to click on the layer. We don't want any type of layer. So we're going to click on no selected layer. I'm going to click on draw line. And I'm just going to draw a little line that goes down the river. And this is what we're talking about when you can do your own custom maps. So I'll do a double click. And then we can see the line that we want to look at. Um, if you know the story, the chemical spill actually went into further down the river um, into these areas and affected quite a few states um, regarding this spill. And then uh, we're going to do two things. So. Um, in the PowerPoint, I did a simple ring 
I clicked on five miles. I put in five miles and then I confirmed the selection area. And that's kind of a lot of space, but uh, you can also do this. So I'm going to click out of that again and I'm not going to do um, a five ring. I'm just going to do a little bit of a buffer, in fact. And I'm going to do like maybe a point one and maybe a point five. And then I'm going to confirm selection area. So isn't that cool? So we can actually do an analysis on just that area that I've chosen. And then here we are again, um, just to show you this, you know, this probably wouldn't be, but I want to show you how this commuting pattern works. So we'll look at the inflow outflow. So maybe people have to get people out of there, <laughs> um, out of the area because of the infected contaminated water, but we can see that 9,488 people um, travel into that little area to work, 200 people live in that area, and then 100, uh, I mean, 1,000, 1,326 uh, live in the area, but work outside of the area. So, you know, we're looking at 9,688 people um, that were probably infected by this chemical spill. So going back to the PowerPoint, um, I'm just going to finish off with a couple resources for learning more uh, for On The Map. So we have the On The Map link here. Uh, we have a lot of help and documentation. So um, everything that I went through, uh, this link will help you, walk you through all of the different steps. We have demos and user guides for On The Map. And then for On The Map for Emergency Management, here is that link, along with the help and documentation and demos and user guides. So with that, I will pass it back to Ryan to finish off um, the other resources. Thank you, Arlene, for that presentation. Let me share my screen. Okay, so finishing up regarding the ACS. First, we have the ACS main page, which is a great tool to start with if you have questions about ACS. This page can be found to you by going to census.gov, selecting surveys slash programs, and then selecting ACS, or simply go to census.gov forward slash ACS. The ACS website contains a lot of information about the survey, data products, tools for data users, and other helpful information. Links to our data tables and tools pages can be found through the ACS data page. These web pages will introduce you to the most popular tools and data products with descriptions and links for each. The data tables page shown in the top right explains each type of ACS table through a series of drop down tabs. For example, you can click the data profiles tab to learn what topics they cover which geographic areas are available for data profiles and common ways to access data profiles. Similarly, the data tools page shown in the bottom right explains each of the tools available for you to access ACS data and another series of drop down tabs. For example, you could click on the quick facts tab to learn about the topics included, the years available, and the geographies available for quick facts as well as a link to the data tool. These pages are designed for, for data users of all skill levels. They succinctly explain the ACS data tables and tools available for data users like you. As I begin to wrap up today's webinar, we invite you to stay in touch with us by telling us how you use data from the American Community Survey. Have you or your organization used ACS data for environmental justice research or planning purposes? If so, please tell us about it by visiting the link at the bottom of the slide to share your story. Furthermore, you can explore all the other ways people are using ACS data in our various Share Your Story publications. 
If you are looking for further assistance on how to obtain or understand ACS data, our data dissemination specialists or DDSs who are located within your region can provide you with assistance about Census Bureau data. These specialists usually provide help in English, but sometimes in other languages as well, depending on the needs of their communities. Whether conducting one-on-one -on -one webinars with business startups or conducting large-scale presentations at universities, these specialists strive to put the public in touch with the data they need. DDSs provide a wide variety of assistance for free. If you are interested in a specific type of training or presentation, please reach out to a specialist in your area using the contact information on the slide. In closing, I encourage you to connect with us directly. You can reach out to either the American Community Survey Office or the Economic Division by phone or by email at the contact information listed on this slide. You can also visit our respective websites to learn more about each topic. And with that, I want to thank all of you for joining us on this webinar today. Again, a recording of today's webinar, along with the slides and a transcript, will be posted online shortly. This concludes the webinar. I hope you have a great day.